Now, I'm very excited to say we have an all-star panel this evening from across the world, and all of these women are involved in different capacities in drowning prevention and water safety education. So this evening, I'm joined by Kara Aidu. Kara is a public health researcher from Ghana. Dr. Katerina Kiadoga, who is a co-founder of IDRA, the International Drowning Researchers Alliance. Kira Gleason, who works in education and development at Water Safety Island. Rihanna Parveen, who's an ECD specialist at the Centre for Injury Prevention and Research, Bangladesh. And Monique Sharp, the National Manager of Marketing and Events for Royal Life Saving Society Australia. Now, without further ado, I'll get straight into joint, being joined by Monique. Now, I'll introduce each of the speakers as they join me on the screen. Monique has 25 plus years of experience working in not-for-profits and the health industry, with 17 years at Royal Life Saving Society Australia. She's passionate about connecting people, programs, content and stories, and motivating people to take action. Her specialty is developing and driving public awareness campaigns and managing events with one goal in mind, to make a difference. She has a Bachelor of Commerce in Marketing and Management and is a strong advocate for drowning prevention. One of her leading achievements has been leading the World Conference on Drowning Prevention in 2011, where she did a terrific job bringing more than 400 people from across, across the globe together in Vietnam for that fantastic meeting. So thanks for joining us tonight, Monique. Thank you, Belinda. Look how young we all look in that photo. Look, and, and for those who don't know us personally, you'll see Amy, Monique and I all in the middle of that shot. So way back at the World Conference on Drowning Prevention. So that's a good place to start. Can you tell me how did you start in drowning prevention? Yeah, no, thanks, Linda. Yeah, so 17 years ago, um, I started with Royal Life Saving. And it, it's funny because the role I was in prior was very much focused on a state level. And I was really looking for a job which wanting to make an impact, but wanting to make a big impact across Australia and potentially internationally. So I um, was really excited um, joining Royal Life Saving and could see very quickly that the difference that this organisation had made in the space. Um, was fortunate enough to work on the World Conference, obviously, so it was nice to see that photo there. Um, you know, it was a, for me, that was a perfect mix with my skills and my talent, um, I guess, with organising events, but really, have fallen in love with, I guess, that water safety, drowning prevention space and the difference that you can make. So can you tell us a little bit about your role now? Yeah, it definitely has evolved. I think in time, I think you can connecting people and programs. And I was very fortunate um, from the start that I had some really great mentors that I was working with. Um, everything needs to be done as a team. And so um, working with education, uh, research, and training, I've been able to use that information and I can see that picture up there, I guess, from working with events uh, with community members. So it might seem like a bit of a random photo, but it was an event that was hosted in Broken Hill, which is in uh, regional New South Wales, Australia. And um, I really love connecting people and, and seeing the difference that it makes. And so, you know, looking at that photo and looking at those two boys, they were so excited to be at an event at a pool where they thought that, you know, every weekend was a party weekend at a pool, but it made a big difference in the sense that, you know, these children learnt to, to learn to swim on a part of a program and that was sort of a celebration at the end of that course and program that they had undertaken. So, and seeing the impact and hearing their stories really makes a big difference and it feels like it's more than just a job, you're actually making a difference. So what's one thing that you've worked on that you're really proud of? Um, I think, I mean, obviously World Conference was a big one because it really was bringing attention to a global issue and um, bringing together people. I guess that's a big thing. I really love connecting people to make a difference and have an impact. Um, so World Conference was one. But the other one that I guess I really wanted to highlight was working with people that don't normally have the opportunity to, to undertake swimming lessons. And so those groups... Um, bring them the opportunity that wouldn't normally come to them. So there was a program that I'd worked on with the Princess Charlene of Monaco Foundation. And um, there was 80 new Australians who were able to take advantage of the program. They learned how to swim and they shared their story with us. That sounds fantastic. I know that we've got a short video to show about that Princess Charlene of Monaco 
um, program that was so successful and so embraced by the multicultural community. Just reflecting now, if you could speak to people outside of water safety and drowning prevention, then you could give them a bit of a sales pitch. What would your sales pitch to women who would be interested in, in looking at water safety, drowning prevention as a future career opportunity for them? I think you've just got to take take the opportunities and be open to learn from others. I think that's a, a really big thing. I mean, I think for me, my journey has been quite diversified because I have had the opportunity to learn for other, from others. Um, I think that that's probably the biggest one. So is there one piece of advice you'd give to a woman who's just starting out, who's right at the beginning of their water safety and drowning prevention career? Mm, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, I think be open to the opportunity. Um, being an advocate for others as well is a really important thing. So showcasing what other people do in the space. So I've been fortunate enough to work um, it's funny with people like Amy and seeing how Amy has developed over that time as well, looking at the research and the programs that she's implemented um, has been really exciting to see. So I think women being advocates for women is really important. So what are you most looking forward to in regards to the next phase of your career? What do you see coming up that's exciting and interesting? Um, I, think, I think for me, because obviously I spend a lot of time in campaigning, and so, you know, looking at all the research that's quite, um, you know, it's important research and trying to target key audiences, but how you can use that information and get campaigning in innovative ways. So obviously trying to reach audiences, you know, back in my day, originally it was, you know, via TV and radio, but social media is such an important medium. So how do we deliver these important safety messages in an innovative way? format that really makes people stop and listen to the message that we're trying to, to to share with others to keep safe by the water. It's interesting, isn't it? I know that you've done a little bit of work over the summer working with social media influencers to do some, some placement. Could you talk to us a little bit about how that's worked? Because I think for a lot of people tuning in, that's a really new area that perhaps their own water safety community hasn't quite got involved with as yet so it'd be lovely to hear about some of that experience yeah I think we've been uh, fortunate obviously in our team uh, Sophie Monks who's been uh, with our team now for six months in social media um, has really helped um, guide us in that format as well so obviously uh, social media and this was targeting like parents and in particular mums and so we were able to target them using social media and other mums talking to other mums you know if that message is in that format they're more likely to listen and stop um, and I think we were really fortunate with the work that Sophie had done that we you know that message did resonate into a bigger audience that we wouldn't normally reach so it was about you know parents keeping watch and, you know, the engagement levels were particularly high with lots of people commenting and sharing that message further than our normal network. So we can't always rely on our normal channels. We have to take that message to other channels. So, yes. Fantastic. Well, look, we might share now that video that you worked on. This video originally is a 4 minute 30 video and the link will be going up in the chat if you'd like to watch the whole video. But we cut it down a little bit for tonight's purposes just to give you a bit of a taster about what the program was about. started the lessons I had a bit of fear going into the water so till my head is out of the water I'm very happy but the minute my head goes in the water then all the fears come in the program is really nice the instructors are they are just awesome they are so adaptable to different cultures the way they teach it has made it very easy like especially treading water the way they talk like oh it's like doing Bangra and I'm like oh yeah we all know Bangra and it's just made it so easy it's, it's more fun Princess Charlene is an Olympic swimmer and when she became the princess of Monaco, she wanted, she wanted to have an impact in a field that she knew well. As a swimmer, um, she was particularly moved about drowning and so she created the foundation in 2012, which goal is to raise awareness for water safety and to save lives by ending drowning. 
the Strata Beach culture, the swimming culture is quite rich here. So we wanted to, to help and participate uh, in the issues here. We had very similar goals with rural life saving to raise awareness and to end drowning, generally speaking. There's many different ways to do this and the, the expertise of uh, rural life saving is something that we really appreciate it. These programs provide wonderful linkages, uh, working with community groups, uh, bringing them into the pool, um, and we also find targeting women. Women are great advocates for water safety, and so working with the women in some of these programs will really encourage other community members to take that step for themselves, but also take that important learn to swim step for their children. Well, that was a lovely note to end and to segue to speak to our next guest this evening. Our next guest is Katarina Kiadoga from Portugal. Uh, Katarina is a microbiologist with a PhD in biology and since 2006 has been engaged in several life-saving projects as well as teaching. She has a special interest in drowning research and prevention issues and in promoting water safety in developing countries as well as non-native and high-risk communities in developed countries. She's concentrated her scientific collaboration in several drowning prevention research projects, actively collaborating with the University of Porto, the University of Vigo, Federation University, the University of Auckland, and the Royal Life Saving Society Australia. She's a member of the Drowning Prevention Commission and the Medical Committee of the International Life Saving Federation. And she's one of the co-founders of IDRA, and I think it's worth noting she's the only woman who is one of the co-founders of IDRA. So it's lovely to have Katerina with us this evening. Katerina, can you start off by telling me a little bit about how you started out in drowning prevention and water safety? Hi, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, similar to Monique, so I started um, my first, I think my first role was assisting um, the World Conference in Portugal in 2007. Uh, so I'm I'm a volunteer. I was a volunteer at that time at the National uh, Life Saving Association uh, in the educational drowning prevention programs, and uh, we had this challenge to propose the organization of the the event in Portugal. Um, and yes, that was my first my first um, connection uh, with the international community of drowning prevention. So. I had great mentors at that time. So I started working with Norm Farmer, which was the person he was working with Royal, but he was the person in ILS that was mediating the process of the organization. And um, yeah, I have good memories of that time. And uh, soon after I started teaching on a, at the vocational course. And then uh, I guess the kickoff, the, the, the real, the real um, when I started doing research and much more uh, dedicating much more time to drowning prevention and water safety was uh, after 2011 uh, conference in Vietnam, where I get to know and re-engage re with all the people that I met in 2007 and then start working and collaborating with many people from other countries to, to develop more uh, drowning prevention in Portugal, which was very incipient at the, at the time. So can you tell me a bit about your role now? So I have I have multiple roles at the moment. So I, I'm a researcher at the Institute of Public Health in the University of Porto. Um, I, I am one of the, as you mentioned, one of the co-founders of the International Drowning Researchers Alliance. And um, uh, I have great news to share because I'm also involved in a very, um, impacting and um, uh, hopefully impacting uh, role that I, I've been recruiting as a consultant for the European region of WHO to be the regional coordinator for the, the work uh, um, for the new project, the World uh, Global Status Report on Drowning Prevention. So it's um, exciting times ahead. Uh, hopefully very impacting in, in terms of policy change and, and awareness in many countries. Um, I know that um, different regions uh, across the globe have very different contexts for drowning and, uh, and one could imagine that Europe is, oh, they already have all figured out, 
but we haven't. It's also a huge, uh, Europe is also a huge uh, region with very different and very varied uh, cultural, economic, geographic contexts that, that make exposure to drowning risks very, very different and very um, nation specific. So that makes it harder to, to have like global guidelines. It also, it all, you always have to be a national um, context specific guidelines. So what's one thing that you've worked on that you're really proud of? Obviously it's going to be hugely exciting working on that world status report. That's an enormous achievement. And is there something in the past though that you're really proud of? Well, um, yeah, there are so many things. Well, it's not, I, I'm, I'm, I, to be honest, I wouldn't mention a particular one because I, <laughs> I have really hard time to point something that I'm really proud of, but I, I have a couple of things that are not. Um, so most of the things that we, and also it's uh, one of the message that I want to, to pass on here is that this is always a teamwork. Um, we might have a leader, someone that is more proficient or more, or has more expertise in a particular topic or is more motivated to lead a project at some point. And, and push others to, to work along. Uh, but it's always a, 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 a teamwork. I had had many mentors. I know it's the International Women's Day, but most of my mentors are men. <laughs> and um, that's one of the things that we can discuss um, also here about the, 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 the gender imbalance that uh, when I started uh, working in, in um, water safety, uh, I was the youngest and the only woman in most of the forums in, in the discussion. So great to see this picture. This is me with the um, ILS, the International Life Saving Federation Medical Committee. Um, so I'm the only woman as uh, in the founders of International Drowning Researchers Alliance. And this is not because women are not uh, worth being there. It's just because traditionally uh, the life-saving community uh, was more operational uh, and medical uh, connected. And in the past, those were roles that were more uh, filled up by, by men. And so those were the, the representatives of the organizations uh, in this umbrella or worldwide organizations such as um, uh, the International Life-Saving Federation. Uh, but I'm, I'm very happy to see this changing. Um, it hasn't changed uh, um, as much as I would like to, but I see that um, many of the commissions of international bodies and, and the working groups within WHO have more and more women integrated. Um, as we saw in the movie, um, in the video that you just showcased uh, with Justin Scar saying, women are great, what the safety advocates. Uh, men are also too, it's just different targets. We have different roles that we can, um, and, and together we can uh, reach out to more people and impact more people. Um, as we know, um, women have this um, cultural and gender role related um, role uh, regarding motherhood. So if we uh, deliver them the messages, they will pass it on, not only to their child, but to anyone because they have this like, natural educator skills <laughs> to pass on this and multiply the seed of drowning of drowning prevention so i've been involved in many in many educational programs uh, aside from my research uh, i love research i love doing uh, science uh, addressing uh, uh, research gaps identifying questions that need to be answered not just for the purpose of having them answered but for the the sake of providing answers and information to, to impact the communities to um, provide uh, information for policy change. Um, but I also like to be involved with the public. So I always keep uh, connected with, with, the, with the community, providing resuscitation courses. Um, also, I am connected with people from uh, Surf Rider Foundation, so cleanup and water safety in terms of quality of the water. I usually go to, to um, surf schools at the beach and uh, show them the biodiversity because it's all connected. I'm, I'm a biologist by background. So 
I always try to make this, uh, we need to live by the water uh, to respect it in terms of safety, but also in terms of the, the nature. And, and if we have this overarching concept of respecting the water and, and um, recreate around the water in a safe um, way, I think it's the best, best um, message to pass to the kids and to the community. And look, just one final question. Given your background and given what you're working on now, I know the theme this year of International Women's Day is embrace equity. What does that mean to you? Well, that's a very, we could stay here all day talking about that. Yeah, but it's, it, it's good that um, um, if we have an International Women Day, Women's Day or whatever day we are celebrating, it means that things uh, we need to make aware there's a difference there. Um, so um, it, it, even though there are many countries that have progressed um, a lot and um, they have almost reached um, sort of <laughs> an equity or gender e equity society, there's always gaps and um, in water safety, that is very um, clear, that is very obvious that um, maybe women still feel that they are not strong enough to be lifeguards or um, I know it's very hard. Uh, it's not an easy um, path um, or career to follow, but it's totally worth it because it's very rewarding to see um, since I first started to see uh, how many women felt empowered to be swimming coaches, water safety advocates in many different areas, campaigning, researching, uh, being involved in the um, in this high level working groups as, such as the WHO technical advisory group for the world, um, uh, the global status report, which has I think almost half of the the group is uh, uh, made by women, um, so it's it's very interesting to see that that change. Um, and uh, for me, uh, equity. Uh, well, it's the definition. It's providing um, providing opportunities that are not equal. They don't need to be equal, but they are just. So it's justice, gender justice. Um, uh, it's the same as for uh, people with disabilities. Um, we don't provide them the same, the exact same opportunities. We should identify what are the specific requirements to them for feel, uh, to fill a, a particular position or a career. And uh, we will provide them the equivalent opportunities so they can reach the same salary, the same high level positions as, as men. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Katerina, for joining us tonight. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions yeah. for you later on. <laughs> Thank and you. I'm going to move to Kira Gleason. Kira is the Education Development Executive for Water Safety Ireland. Within her role, Kira promotes, manages and supports the goal of developing a strong water safety culture through our water safety education programs, Hold Hands, Paws and Wise. Kira grew up on the west coast of Ireland, so water has always played a huge part in her life, particularly water safety. She started out swimming competitively during the winter and trained in surf lifesaving during the summer. And she's represented Ireland at the European Surf Lifesaving Championships, so another sporting person with us tonight. Um, her passion for the water led into her work as a beach lifeguard, a pool lifeguard, a swim teacher and water safety instructor. Working with Water Safety Ireland now allowed her to turn that passion into making real change in water safety education in Ireland. Thanks so much for joining us today, Kira. I know it's an early start in Ireland. Thank you so much, Linda. It's good to be here. So can you tell me a little bit about how you started in water safety? Yes, yeah, so as you just mentioned there, you know, I started off um, swimming competitively uh, during the winter in the pool. And then the summer, we got out onto the beach to surf lifesaving. Um, and I started in water safety and drowning prevention in a voluntary capacity, um, you know, uh, spending the summer on the west coast of Ireland, uh, delivering water safety instructing in, a, in water safety Ireland summer weeks. 
Um, in 2012, I then got qualified as a beach lifeguard, a pool lifeguard, swim teacher and water safety instructor. Um, and up until that point, fast forward to 2021, where I got hired um, by Water Safety Ireland's national office. So now I'm in the position where I am, you know, delivering water safety education as a career. So it's, it's a good position to be in. So tell me a little bit about your role. We heard a couple of names, acronyms for different projects. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Absolutely. So um, one of the main roles uh, that I undertake is the development, the delivery and the promotion of our educational programmes. So we have our early years programme, which is our hold hands for three to five years old. And we've got our pause programme, which is our primary aquatic water safety programme for primary school students. So, you know, from about five years up until 12, 13 years old. And then we've got our WISE programme, which is our newly launched secondary school programme, um, which is aimed specifically at TY, so around the 16 year olds. Um, so, you know, within the education programmes, I also do that. Then I also work on the development of strategic partnerships, you know, with other organisations like the ORNLI. We've got the Irish Coast Guard, Scouting Ireland. We did a lot of work with incoming Ukrainian refugees when they first arrived in, um, you know, providing safety talks, water safety demonstrations. Anyone who listened to me, I'll talk to them about water safety. <laughs> um, you know, so, so a lot of learned that uh, I inform on our marketing campaigns. We do a lot of radio, audio and digital print as well. So lots and lots of um, things to be doing to keep busy. So if we can just flick to your advice for a woman starting out, because obviously you started in that participant role and really grew and have changed that into a career what would your one piece of advice be for that younger version of you just starting out I would say that like there is so many opportunities within this space and there's so many different avenues to getting involved in water safety education and drowning prevention you know um, as a water safety advocate through education giving safety talks or demonstrations through sport as a competitor a referee an examiner a coach you know there's there is so many different ways to get in. And if there's anyone listening in Ireland, um, I'd love to just say that I could be that support if you want to reach out and I can point you in the right direction of getting involved in water safety in Ireland. You know, uh, Water Safety Ireland is an organisation with over 5,000 volunteers. So it is a huge community and it's a great community to be part of. And if I can be a, a stepping stone for anybody listening, I'm, I'm very happy to be that. I think my contact information will be in the chat box or uh, they'll be able to access it that way anyway. So... And look, I know it must be hard with all of those different programs that you've worked on, but is there one thing that you've worked on that you're particularly proud of or that you'd like to highlight? Um, one particular project, and again, as Dr. Katarina mentioned, you know, these are all collaborative projects. So I actually worked with a woman um, in early childhood education to develop, to further develop our Hold Hands, our early years program. So it was originally launched as a, as a physical resource pack. And last year, we redeveloped that resource pack into an online program um, and incorporated sociodramatic processes. You know, it's a three to five years old. It's kind of hard to get that engagement and, and retention of information. So it was all about uh, bringing play into the learning. So we did that through um, drama and role play. So if there was a storyboard on going to the beach, the children would all dress up as lifeguards and discuss what a role of the lifeguard is and why they're wearing what they are and what they, their job entails. We also have messy play. So, you know, creating a, a beach space or a beach corner um, through storytelling, through arts and crafts. Uh, and the, the whole idea around incorporating this sociodramatic process was to really not only extend the learning for the students, but also to empower the educators to deliver the water safety education. You know, it's there, it's fun. Um, water is something to enjoy, but let's learn how to enjoy it safely. So look, if you were doing your sales pitch, you're standing in an elevator, you've got two minutes to convince somebody to get involved in water safety and drowning prevention. What's your sales pitch? Well, as I said, like there is so many opportunities in this role and there's so many opportunities for growth in this role. Like we're all here today. It's an international conversation. Um, so if it is something that you're passionate about, consider this your public service announcement to apply for that role or to sign up for that course, whatever it is. Um, you know, there is opportunities there and and it's, it's a great space to be in. Fantastic. Look, thank you so much, Kira. We'll be back to you later on. Um, thank you, Belinda. I might just use the opportunity to segue because you were talking um, there about early career, early career and early childhood um, development. Um, one of our speakers today actually is an ECV specialist. So 
Uh, Rihanna Parveen um, is an ECD specialist at the Centre for Injury Prevention and Research, Bangladesh. Now, this is a space that has a very, very particular place in my heart because my journey in water safety prevention and drowning prevention work started off way back when in Thailand and Bangladesh. So this is my umbrella um, you're seeing on screen for when there was a cyclone and I was out in the field doing interviews. So um, CIPRB is very, very close to my heart. Um, Rihanna currently works as an ECD specialist and she's worked previously as a research assistant at Kingston University. Her role is to make sure that 500 community ECD specialist centres qualify for comprehensive drowning reduction project. It's called Bahas Bahasa. And I might get you to pronounce, um, correct my pronunciation there, Rihanna, in the southern part of Bangladesh. As an ECD specialist, she provides mentoring and technical support to the team of ECD mentoring officers to develop 1,400 caregivers. Her other responsibilities cover planning and designing activities, developing curriculum, training and standing operating procedures and guidelines, and organising and conducting capacity development training of trainers. So Rihanna has a very wide remit um, looking after that program and I'm sure now Rihanna and Kira will be in touch afterwards because I'm sure there's lots of learnings that could be passed between the two of them. But um, Rihanna, if I could start with you, if you could tell me a little bit about how you started off in drowning prevention. Thank you, um, Linda. Um, yeah, I'm hearing all of uh, uh, the women here. It's, it's, it's been like the same journey. That I have. Um, I started uh, with CIPRB working as an ECD specialist from joining um, uh, when I was applying for the job. I didn't know that it's a drowning prevention project. So I thought, okay, I'm going to work uh, for an ECD uh, specialist and my job is, uh, you know, working for children. When so when I started um, and applied and I got the job and I was uh, so surprised and overwhelmed uh, because my passion always has been working for the children and, you know, and, and education. But when I saw the impact of my um, role, uh, because it's, it's not only changing the learning or development of the children, it's also uh, uh, having an impact on their uh, on their life, you know, uh, saving them from drowning. So I felt very lucky to uh, involve in this uh, organization and, you know, working with the Down Information team in Bangladesh. Now, I know that the program that you're involved with is hugely influential globally now because it started off in Bangladesh doing these crash programs. Can you describe a little bit about why that was necessary and why it is important in, in a Bangladeshi context? Okay, um, yeah, as you all might know already that it's the drowning is a leading cause of child drowning in Bangladesh. So a uh, child uh, mortality. So I think it's, it's, uh, um, it's an important um, cause an important um, area that uh, actually uh, we should even uh, in all the sector should work, uh, start working. Um, as I already mentioned that I didn't know that, you know, the, um, the causes of child death is drowning and it has a huge, um, in my, my job has a huge impact and the people who are working in the drowning prevention um, and in, in CIPRB, uh, they are working for, I think it's been like 18 years the CIPRB is working and they have developed, uh, you know, lifetime of, or they have pioneered the work of the world um, in drowning and you know there's uh, WHO guideline everything was uh, drawn from this work so I think uh, I think it just started and I recently the you know down information resolution has been passed and now this is uh, the growing interest for the world to work at so I, I, I'm, I'm really really uh, you know uh, happy and, and I'm really um, hopeful that everybody is now started working and will be uh, really uh, will work in a way to prevent drowning worldwide. 
So the ECD program is remarkable for the way it lifts women up, isn't it? There's the majority of those caregivers that are employed are women, as I understand. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like 1,400 um, caregivers right now. And, and also this piece of work is actually changing the uh, women's role in the community because you know previously they were neglected um, because they were only uh, involved in household work. But now uh, they are involved in uh, children's uh, learning and saving life. So they are respected in many ways in the community. So in that way, you also, you know, uh, contributing in uh, empowering with women in the community. So this is, this is the another part of this, you know, another remarkable part of the turning prevention work that we are doing in Bangladesh. So can you tell me a little bit about something that you've worked on that you're really proud of? Yeah, um, I think there are, I mean, there are a lot of things that I can talk since I joined here um, that I'm proud of, but one particular thing that I really wanted to want to mention is that the drowning prevention, the, the intervention that I'm doing is already been proven that, you know, uh, the um, actual center is effective for child drowning, 80% um, effective for uh, preventing drowning of children. But it has never been tested whether the, you know, ECD intervention is actually um, has uh, intervention has any impact um, by doing by, by providing this down information intervention. So we are uh, we have actually uh, tested this um, conducted research um, under the Bhasha project uh, that is implemented by um, you know uh, Royal Life National uh, Life Society Life, Royal National Life Institution UK. So um, we have actually did the baseline and we have conducted an inline inline for the ECD intervention and then um, and it has shown that the ECD intervention has a positive impact on uh, child. Um, positive impact on child early learning that downing prevention intervention has uh, providing. So this is the thing uh, that I'm very proud of. And I think I'm waiting for the publication because it's already submitted. So I think uh, once it will be out, I will share with you all of you. Fantastic, please do. And we'll make sure that everybody who's tuned in today does get a copy of that because it's a remarkable achievement. Um, I guess the final question for you is, what you're most looking forward to next. So you've got this publication coming out, but what's next for you at CIPRB and in working in this drowning prevention water safety space? All right. Um, I think there are a lot of exciting things coming up in Bangladesh and going going on, um, because one of the you know larger project uh, is coming. Um, going to be implemented in Bangladesh that is actually larger scales downing prevention project um, it will be a, a, it will be implemented by um, uh, government of Bangladesh and Ministry of uh, Women and Children Affairs and it will be um, it will start it will be implemented 16,000 uh, daycare centers, so 8,000 daycare centers around 16 uh, district, and it will uh, supervise, give, give the supervision service for 200 children. So this will be one of the projects that I will be, uh, you know, providing my expertise for, and that I'll, I'm very excited about. And another thing is that, you know, the Bhasha project, it has a uh, uh, it has completed its first phase in 2001, sorry, 2019. And then there are there is a learning uh, came out of it that that under two children's, uh, you know, uh, under two children's supervision is not effective in the in the actual. So we have started another project um, um, that is actually will be implied, uh, that is uh, um, that is coming from NIHR. And, and that also um, will be um, working on developing a new, uh, maybe it can be anything new intervention for under two children. So I am involved in that. So I think uh, there are a lot of you know things coming in. Apart from project, my, per my personal level, I will be uh, involved in more research and more collaboration that can 
um, you know, uh, increase the effectivity of the intervention. So. Fantastic. Again, Rihanna, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you and congratulations on that research project. I know that it is a massive undertaking getting that together and uh, it's a huge achievement. So congratulations. Um, <laughs> our final speaker this evening joining us is Kara Adu. Kara is a public health researcher based in Ghana. Um, she has a demonstrated passion in community research projects. Since 2013, she's contributed to the success of many projects in Ghana, serving in regional supervisory roles. Some of the projects she's participated in include understanding drowning in Ghana, water sanitation and hygiene survey, emergency obstetric and newborn care survey, and comprehensive abortion care survey. So she has a wide variety of interest in that research space. Her experience ensuring research data is accurately collected while leading a drive to liaise with community leaders across the country with diverse cultural differences and assets that few can match. Cara supports a number of global health initiatives as a site liaison for programs such as the Global Regional Anesthesia Curriculum Engagement. So Cara has a great deal of experience in the research space and we're delighted that she's able to join us this evening. Can it, Cara, can you tell me a little bit about your current role and the, and the vast projects that you're working on? That's a lot of different research to be undertaking. Yes, thank you, Belinda. So um, like you said, I'm a public health researcher and I serve as a field supervisor in um, our organization that is involved in public health research. Um, I play a multiple role of managing communication between our field enumerators who directly collect data on the field and our central staff who manage the data that is collected. In addition, I'm often involved in the training, in facilitating the training of enumerators before each survey begins. And this involves teaching the enumerators, um, teaching them, training them to understand the basics, basic concepts of the survey we are going to conduct, understand the objectives of the survey, understand how to ask questions uh, in respect with respect to the objectives of the survey. I also play a key role in translating English text questionnaire to the local languages because most of the community based surveys we conduct are conducted in the local languages. I also engage community leaders and stakeholders trying to gain access into the community, gaining access to local resources and expertise that will assist in our data collection. Yeah. So our current, yeah, our current, um, our current research, which is understanding drowning in Ghana, I've also served as a supervisor, field supervisor in the project. And I've also been involved in directly collecting data from the field, as in conducting face-to-face -face interviews with victims, family members of drowned victims, and then um, survivors of drowning incidents, and also collecting data from database, uh, the database of institutions that are involved in rescue missions, like the National Disaster Management Organization, our fire service here, the police service, and then places where the records are kept, records of drowning incidents are kept. So like the mortuary and other places, yes. So that's a huge remit and working in multiple different languages. Um, can you tell me a little bit more specifically about this drowning project? And is it looking both at fatal and non-fatal incidents? And what are some of the questions it's exploring? Yes, yeah, so, so for this particular survey, we went into the communities. We, we, we did both qualitative data collection and quantitative. We went into the communities to talk to people who have lost relatives who, to drowning. So, and then we went to communities where 
um, fishing is done where people mostly travel on water bodies and communities that are prone to flooding, the, they were, the study districts were randomly selected. So we had the opportunity to go to many different places, dry areas, places with water, inland water bodies, and then the coastal areas. Now we talked to, like I said, for the non-fatal drowning incidents, we talked to survivors, people who had, who had had near death experiences in water, they had been submerged, had water going into their airways and taken out of the water, some taken to hospital, some um, having water pressed out of their bellies on the beaches and wherever, and they survived. Then we also spoke to people who had relatives or friends who had drowned and people who may be unrelated, but were witnesses of the drowning incidents. Um, for it's, it's, it's been a very emotionally engaging survey. I mean, imagine talking to a mother who, had, who has lost their child in a drowning incident, and you could see that some of the incidents were, they happen under very avoidable circumstances. The, we had children drown who were just things have happened if there was a fall from boats and things into river bodies. And if they knew how to swim, they would have made it, but they don't know how to swim, so they just drown. And the, the, there's also a general perception here in, in our part of the world the issue of drowning is actually shrouded in a lot of mystery, a lot of superstition, where many people believe that water bodies have spirits indwelling them. And then even in our local language, the phrase we used to describe drowning means that the water has taken the person. So people having the perception that the water body took the person away and people working in unsupervised mining sites who were who drowned in the, the pits they had made and all. And people thinking that the water has taken the person away. And um, personally, I think that some on, on our water bodies, some people don't really take precaution because they have their mindset that it is the water that takes the person. So once you think the, there's a spirit taking the water, then you are not thinking of preventive measures because you leave yourself to fate thinking that if, if it will happen, it will happen. Yes, so this, like I said, has been very engaging emotionally. It's been traumatizing even for us, the data collectors and for the respondents as well, because you go to a place. I remember where one of my colleagues interviewed a woman who had lost a child just a year to the time of the interview. So kind of talking to people to relieve their most painful experiences. And yes, that, that, that's it. So, and we've had, I mean, we've had, um, we've picked data from different places and seen how people drown in so many different things, river bodies, lakes, the sea, septic tanks, children, children actually drowning in septic tanks in, um, a bucket of water, a pan of water, a wells. And I mean, this has been, it, this is something that happens, you know, as a field researcher, I go to the field often, every once in a while you hear of a drowning incident that has happened. And because we didn't have data to actually say that, this number of people drown in this community per year, I think people had not really taken it up seriously as a matter of interest. Yes, but with this project, going in, picking up the data, seeing what is actually on the ground, describing the, the drowning bedding, the, seeing the high risk group or high risk communities has been very insightful and we we are we've the, the survey has just ended. We are still working on analysis and, and report writing. 
but this is going to go a long way to, to affect the policies that are made and then strategies that will be put in place for drowning prevention. Yeah. About how long is it until the survey has concluded and the findings have been analyzed and published? Sorry? About how long will, is it now until the findings are analyzed and then published? I think um, in a couple of weeks, we should be done, yeah. Excellent. Well, we'll make sure that we again share that research when it's published with all of the participants on this call, because I'm sure people will be very interested to hear the results of that research. So yeah. tell me about how for you, you became involved in, in drowning research specifically? Yes. So like I said, I work for a public research organization. We have the opportunity of working on various research subjects that bother the community. And like I said, going into the field, you mostly get, you hear and see issues that affect people. And for me personally, the issue of drowning, especially children drowning, and then women drowning, women just going to fetch water and falling into the river body or a well and dying as a result of that has been a bother to me. I was actually looking for an opportunity to do something to help solve the situation. So when my organization got involved, um, got into a collaboration with CDC, Center for Disease Control, CDC Foundation and Bloomberg Philanthropist to join to do this understanding drowning in Ghana survey, I saw it as a great opportunity to get involved and see what I could also do, what, what I can contribute to drowning prevention. Now, obviously, this is a deeply sensitive area and a very difficult area to be talking to people about. If you were talking to a young woman who was wanting to move into this area of research, um, what advice would you have for them about taking care of themselves and, and making sure that they look after their own well-being through the process? Yes. So um, I think that the basic advice I'll give to any woman trying to get into research or any measure of prevention of drowning in Ghana or in a part of the world will be that first they should be conversant with the cultural practices and beliefs of the people they are going to. And am I saying this? Like I said, the issue of drowning is shrouded in a lot of superstition. So you, when you are going to somebody who thinks well, I'm, I'm, it's not because I can't swim that I'm getting drowned, but uh, because the river, I've offended the river body and the river body wants to take me away. Then you, any, any measure or strategy you want to put in place or suggest to them may not be something that is taken. So they, they need every woman who wants to venture this way to understand the culture of the people. Yeah, so any woman getting into this needs to get conversance with what is done there, what the people believe, so that they can make an intelligent input into the measures that are being suggested or the strategies being put in place. And then if the person is going into research, you need to, again, understand how sensitive the issue is in order to know how to talk to the people to be able to get good responses from them. And it's also very important, it's very important to do good community entry because the people are mostly influenced by the, their community leaders. You can't just enter into a community and start discussing such a sensitive topic with the people. So you need to do very good community entry, get the stakeholders involved, engage them, get the community leaders to 
understand what you are doing and approve of you and introduce you into the community. And then I think that is a good way to start off. Thank you so much, Cara. Look, thank you to all of our speakers this evening. I'm now going to hand over to my co-host, Dr. Amy Pedden. Amy has been in the background monitoring the chat as it's been going on this evening and monitoring your questions. And she is now going to um, moderate those questions for the rest of the evening. So thank you very much and over to Amy. Great. Thank you so much, Belinda, and thank you to all our speakers. It's been really interesting. Uh, I would encourage people to put their questions in the chat. I've been frantically writing my own because I just couldn't help myself. Um, but if anyone does have any questions for our speakers, please pop them in the chat. We've got about 15 minutes now. Um, but while we wait for those to come through, I want to invite Monique Sharp back on. Um, we heard about your pivotal role in WCDP 2011 in Da Nang in Vietnam, and we all have really wonderful memories of that event. Um, but we haven't really had much of a chance to discuss WCDP 2023, which will be happening later this year um, in Perth in December. So you'll also have a leading role in the organisation of this conference. Uh, so what are you most looking forward to for WCDP 2023? I think it's exciting to see people um, back together again face to face. Obviously, with COVID-19, we haven't been able to do that. So um, really excited and really excited it's in Australia so obviously being based in Australia and I might be a little bit biased but Perth is pretty special um, it's a beautiful part of Australia lots to do and see around the um, excited to see the amount of abstracts that have come through and I've had a little sneak peek at um, some of the abstracts submitted and there's some great research and programs and, and campaigns which is my personal preference campaigns and seeing how people turn uh, research into messaging in a communication space so um, hopefully like obviously with the people in the session today and and hearing from all these other inspirational women I'm excited to see them hopefully present and share their their findings and work to a bigger audience but you're excited too Amy I reckon you'd be on a few of those papers <laughs> Absolutely. Seeing what's coming through is really exciting. I've, I'm doing double duty here. So I just put a okay, link in the yeah. chat to the conference website. I hope I've got that link right. It's not hyperlinking, but uh, yeah, encourage everyone to check out the website. Um, if there's another call for abstracts, please submit your work and we hope to all see you in Perth. Thank you so much, Monique. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Katarina Kuroga back now as well. Um, Katarina, hopefully you're still there. Yeah, great. So I wanted to ask, it's really exciting to hear that we'll soon have a global status report on drowning and fabulous that you'll be taking that coordination role in Europe, which I think is 52 countries. It's going to be a massive job, but really fascinating. I guess, what do you hope the impact will be for this global uh, status report in Europe or specifically in Portugal? Um, and how important is data in research in getting us to the point of having a global status report on drowning? Thank you. So yeah, yeah, I think the 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 most challenging bit is for countries that uh, they seem to think that drowning is not a big problem. Um, they have higher um, uh, efforts are and budget dedicated to other health issues. And uh, even if um, the, the 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 drowning uh, death rates or the even considering the non-fatal are not as high as other problems. They are mostly all preventable. So it's a burden that we can uh, avoid, uh, a burden in terms of like economic burden <laughs> for the policymakers, but also um, a social burden. Um, and and I, I believe that in, in the case of Portugal, uh, specifically for Portugal, um, I hope it has the impact of uh, creating a movement uh, for for change. So having just having the stakeholders together discussing uh, what is the data available and what is not, and aligning um, their priorities with the UN resolution uh, or not, but th they will realize how far uh, they need to come or whatever what are uh, the current status regarding drowning prevention efforts. And hopefully that will impact um, policy change in the in the midterm. And I, I think it's across Europe, it's uh, very similar. Um, 
Of course, as I mentioned before, uh, it's a, a, a large uh, uh, region with, uh, with many countries and different realities. Um, I, I saw that you, you had to the, to the chat a, a link to, to a, a paper that we, we, we produced uh, last year. Um, and, and that just comes to uh, make the point that we can't solely rely on data estimates. Um, we need country specific information. And even if people are fed up with researchers and data scientists, like, oh, you just want very reliable data. Actually, I think for, I'm, I'm more in the academic side of things. Although I really enjoy to have high quality data, I know that's not realistic for most cases. And um, what is important is to have context specific information, even if the data is not like, we don't need to distinguish if we were 100 deaths or 110. We need to know which were the risk factors of those that died or that suffered the drowning event. So age groups, um, geographic locations, um, behaviors, and uh, so risky behaviors. And those, th that information is more, I think is more important than having the national global figure for drowning deaths or drowning um, non-fatal and fatal uh, numbers. Um, and I think that the global stats report will have that, um, will achieve that because it's a very comprehensive um, collection of information and it will gather information regarding um, water safety programs, legislation in place. So it will give an idea of the current drowning prevention efforts in each nation. And hopefully we can provide some guidance on how to uh, progress further in those efforts. Great. Thank you so much for your perspectives. It's a big job ahead, but I'm sure you're going to do a great job. And let's hope that people never get sick of researchers or we will have a problem. Yes. Thank you so much, <laughs> Katerina. Um, can I invite Kira Gleason back? Um, I hope she's still on the call. Hi. Hey, <laughs> nice oh, yeah. to virtually meet you. Um, I know, face to face finally. <laughs> yeah, I guess this counts as face to face now. Um, so it's interesting. I had a similar question for you as what Belinda has put in the chat. Um, it was very gracious of you to offer for everyone to email you or um, maybe not everyone in the world, <laughs> well, everyone I in can Ireland. Help Ireland specific. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great of you to offer. But aside from everyone emailing you, how do you think we can offer to support women uh, coming forward in drowning prevention? Well, in drowning prevention, I think I'm in a really lucky position in Ireland, especially in Water Safety Ireland. You know, we have our current chairperson is a woman. Our current CEO is a woman and 75 percent of staff in the national office are women. Um, you know, so knowing that there is that place there and, and that there is opportunities within this space to get involved, whether it be through research like yourself and Dr. Katarina, um, you know, through sport, through education like myself, like there is if if at all it comes to your mind, like I would love to get involved in water safety. There is that space for you and, um, you know, do feel like you can put yourself forward to get into those spaces. Absolutely. That's excellent advice. And I hope everyone heeds that on the call um, and we all do our best to, to elevate women in drowning prevention moving forward. Thank you so much for sharing your perspectives tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Amy. And your LinkedIn uh, profile's in the chat, so I guess expect to be inundated. <laughs> <laughs> it's no problem. I wel I'm welcoming it, so thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, can I ask uh, Rihanna to come back? Um, I have yeah, a question. I'm here. <laughs> Hi, great. <laughs> I've got a question. Um, this is a very difficult one. I'm sorry. Um, CRPRB do some incredible, groundbreaking, world-leading work in drowning prevention, but... Uh, and we've heard about some of the amazing things you do, but what is the best part of your job, do you think? Um, if I um, talk, I already mentioned, but I think the best part of my job is uh, that it, my job has, a, you know, multiple, um, um, multiple um, beneficiary uh, impact like you know i'm working with the the caregivers and also um city uh, mentoring officers so 
uh, time to time, I have to give them technical support, uh, but sometimes it's also the mentoring support, you know, so that they regularly face in the job. And 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 I think um, that is the one of the things that I find very, uh, you know, motivating uh, to be staying and continuing this job. And yeah, I think uh, apart from doing other work, so this is the thing that I love. And maybe I'm not directly uh, contacting with the caregivers, uh, implementing the work in the field, but I think um, sometimes I actually uh, provide or uh, do the mentoring to the mentoring officer. So uh, I think this is really very important because, you know, they're in the community level for us because we can reach out to anyone for any support. You know, I'm in that position, but for them, it's really, their support system is very limited. So, um, you know, just one piece of advice can change their, you know, life and change their situation, overcoming the challenges they're facing in, the, in this community is huge. So, yeah. That's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and keep doing the amazing work you're doing. I know I'm sure I can speak for everyone when I say that we really look up to all the work that CRPRB have done over the years and continue to do. It's really incredible. So thank you for sharing your insights and uh, I hope you continue to be successful in the future as well. Thank you, Emmy. Thank you thank for having you. me. I'd uh, just like to invite Cara back and please all our speakers don't leave just yet. I'd love to have everyone back on camera in a minute, but if Cara is still here, um, I've got a question for you. I think she's coming back. Hopefully. Um, I hope you can hear me, Cara. Um, the work that you have mentioned. Hello. Hi. <laughs> the work you've mentioned is really um, impactful and we're all looking forward to the results. I'd like to hear from you what you hope the future looks like for drowning prevention in Ghana after this project is complete. Yeah. So sorry, I didn't hear the first part of the question. My internet was quite unstable. Uh, if I got you right, you are looking at the, the future for drowning prevention. Yeah. Did I get you right, please? Yeah, yeah. That's in Ghana. Yeah. So I think that um, having quality data that describes the burden, that describes the circumstances that surrounding the, the that surrounds the bed, the the incidents of drowning is a good step to start this whole process. And there are actually some organizations around that are working uh, on a low key level for drowning prevention. But I think that having the true picture of what goes on in the country is going to help us, is going to affect, is going to impact um, policy changes. And I think that looking at um, getting the true picture, like I said, getting from the communities, understanding what really happens, like understanding that women go to fetch water and they fall into the wells and things, basic things like that is going to actually help what kind of measures, help determine what kind of measures should be put in place. I also think that more people are going to be brought on board to help advocacy more people are going to be more people are going to understand that it's important to let's say get into swim get swimming lessons and put in protective measures like wearing um life jackets on the river body when they are traveling and things like that so personally i think that the future is bright i think that we are going to put in when we finish collecting our data if i can say this we had a, a dissemination where we invited all the stakeholders and told them what we found on the, on the field. And uh, I remember clearly the Minister of Education and the Minister of Health were all present. They were a bit surprised at the figures we were mentioning and the things we were saying were happening because um, they had not really seen it as it was and had not put in place any, there wasn't, for, for the Minister of Health, there wasn't any budget 
allocated for drowning prevention and things like that. So I remember him saying they are going to now think about it. They are going to have a budget for drowning prevention. The Minister of Education was thinking about how to uh, put, in, put in place measures to have children educated on safety around water bodies and things like that. So I think a lot is going to be done in this aspect of drowning prevention. That's incredible to Thank hear. You. Really hope that that all comes together because that's an amazing uh, commitment to receive from different government ministries. So I really hope that we hear some um, good news soon on that front. Thank you for sharing. Can I invite... Thank you too. Yeah, you're welcome. I, can I invite all our speakers to just turn their cameras on again? This is the chance for the drowning prevention uh, selfie for social media, if anyone would like to take one and share. Um, but I just would like to wrap up, wrap up now. I think you'll all agree it's been a really fabulous webinar. Um, our sincere thanks on behalf of Belinda and myself to our speakers who've been so generous with their time and their insights. We'd also like to thank the International Life Saving Federation, in particular the Drowning Prevention and Public Education Commission, and thank you to Royal Life Saving and Will Coon behind the scenes for all the technical support as well. In the spirit of International Women's Day's theme of embracing equity, we've tried to shine a light on women in drowning prevention, bringing women's abilities and contributions to the forefront. Although we've heard from women who are very successful at what they do, uh, we all need to reach out and back and elevate women in drowning prevention that don't always get the limelight. In closing, we're very much looking forward to seeing you all in Perth for the World Conference on Drowning Prevention in 2023, and also to see what comes out from the drowning prevention sector tomorrow for International Women's Day. Let's all continue to commit to embracing equity and drowning prevention. Thank you and good night from Sydney.